This is the WOW Signal Podcast, a production of Dream of the Open Channel. It's August 2013, and this is Episode 10, The Serendipity Schema. Welcome. This is your host, Paul Carr. This time, we are going to once again pick up the thread from Episode 5, our introduction to the search for Bracewell probes. However, this time we are going to consider the broader class of alien artifacts, both physical and virtual. In Episode 8, we talked with Duncan Forgan about how we might be able to observe ongoing asteroid mining in another solar system. But in this episode, I'd like to concentrate primarily on what we would find closer to home and how we can bring scientific respectability and hence scientific attention to this search. Before we get into that, however, I want to clearly state my views on the possibility that non-human intelligences are now interacting with humanity. For those who have listened to all the past episodes of this podcast or who have read my blog, This will be something of a recap, but bear with me. My view is that of a sympathetic skeptic. I can't deny that an ET presence is a possibility and a profoundly intriguing one at that. I think about it almost every day. I've written on my blog, the entry is called Doubt as a Core Value, links in the show notes, that to me, to believe in something is to act and think as if it is true. In this sense, I am not a believer in an alien presence. I am also not a disbeliever, and I don't even think it's highly improbable. I do have serious problems with both sides of this question, and it has to do with evidence. The problem is, that we have no idea what an alien presence would be like, except that we would expect it to be bewildering and conceptually beyond our grasp. When we say there is or isn't any evidence at all for an ET presence, we simply don't know what we're talking about. Are we stuck there? I believe we are not. The solution is to boldly ask the wrong questions and carefully proceed to discover we have the wrong answers. For example, would Bracewell probes be designed anything like how we would design them? Almost certainly not. But let's devise ways to look for the ones we would design, and on the other side of failing to find them, we will have better questions. The essence of my message is not just to accept that there is doubt and uncertainty, but to embrace it. In our lifetimes, final answers are vanishingly unlikely. Abjure the dogmas. Love the mysteries of reason. On the subject of SETA, the search for extraterrestrial artifacts, There is no reason to believe that ET starships could not visit our solar system, but given that our planet has been here for over 4 billion years, there is, at least statistically speaking, far less reason to believe that they would have come here specifically to visit modern humans. Far more likely, it would seem, is a visit in the very distant past, perhaps even before the age of the dinosaurs. Let's get some perspective. If I recall correctly, dinosaurs were here on Earth for about 180 million years until they had a really bad day about 65 million years ago. Humans have been here well less than a million years. Do the math. The dinosaurs were much more likely to see an ET visitation than we are. 
If ET robots, or even ET biological beings, known as EBEs in the trade, did visit our solar system long ago, they may not have landed on Earth. Why take all the risks of flying through an atmosphere, not to mention the risks of becoming T-Rex's lunch, when you could probably learn all you wanted from orbit? If these mysterious travelers needed to harvest materials, the moon or asteroids would make far more sense. There is too much confusion about the perceptual byproducts of human visual faculties when applied to images of off-world landscapes. I am referring to the common tendency to look at pictures of rocks on Mars or the moon and see things that demonstrably aren't there. Believing is seeing. Scientists and the public are besieged with these unfounded claims to the extent that some of the better space exploration websites have permanently banned all discussion of them. I completely understand the repulsion that serious people feel for this sort of thing. But the scientific search for artifacts of ancient ET visitations cannot be disrespected because of this noise. Geologist and space entrepreneur Ben Wright McGee has been doing quite a lot of thinking about how to proceed scientifically in the search for ET artifacts. As you will hear, SETA is a science in its infancy, and the next steps are going to be tentative. But for now, what is mainly needed is to beat back the giggle factor and to start a serious conversation about what we are looking for and how to proceed. Let's begin that conversation right now. Ben? Hey, Paul. Hi. Hey, how's it going? Good, good. I'm, oh. I first heard of you when you did that National Geographic show <laughs> a couple of years ago. Yeah. I don't want to ask you much about that, but then I, that caused me to go to your website, and I saw that you had written a couple of things that I found really interesting. One was about xenoarchaeology and the search for extraterrestrial artifacts, which is a major thread of this podcast. I've, I've already done an episode on bracewell probes and I'm, Sweet. um, and the, the broader context is just SETA in general and SETI. Yeah. And, uh, what do you think the most promising avenues are? Let's start with what you call xenoarchaeology or the search for extraterrestrial artifacts. What got you interested in that? Uh, well, actually I, uh, I took a, a sidelong route into it. Um, it was actually via industrial archaeology which is the archaeology of more modern human constructions. But now anything greater than 50 years into the past is encompassed by archaeology, which now includes the Industrial Revolution, which is the context that normally shows up this term industrial archaeology. Uh, but I ended up working on the uh, um, decommissioning of some of NASA's nuclear rocket development station facilities here in Nevada. And hmm. learning about them, I actually learned that we tested superior rocket technology in the 1960s with really elegant design. The nuclear reactor is just used to generate heat. And those are archaeological sites now. We don't have this technology anymore. And suddenly the idea that you could approach advanced technology from an archaeological perspective, it really uh, lit me up. And I started thinking about applying that same sort. There were so few archaeologists that were you know, trained or, or had the background necessary to interpret spaceflight technology. I thought... Well, wow, if we actually did this in, an, in a, a planetary context, say a rover actually stumbled across something genuinely strange on Mars, well, neither, I, I argue, neither the archaeologists nor the planetary scientists, because each is sort of ignorant of this, the technical proficiencies of the other, no one would be prepared to actually investigate that right or correctly, no matter if it turned out to be legitimate or not. And that's what kind of sent me scurrying off as a, as a planetary geologist into the world of archaeology. And uh, it's been sort of an adventure. So you, you wrote a paper in which you called for a certain approach to the discovery of, of alien artifacts in the solar system. Right. Uh, and you noted that people report on the Internet every day that they've seen an, something on Mars that looks like 
a machine. Right. Uh, so how do we filter that out and get to the genuine real anomalies? Well, and you know, that's in my mind, that was one of the functions of actually developing a rigorous, credible field of study, much like astrobiology. Uh, well, we have yet to discover any alien life yet. That's a thriving scientific field. Uh, Xenoarchaeology can help us understand ourselves by looking at our own archaeological artifacts from a different viewpoint, uh, and at the same time serve as a uh, and the actual mechanism by which we do filter those things out. I mean, if there are growing experts who are thinking seriously about integrating planetary science and archaeology, well, those would be the very people, and they would be developing the very methods that you would apply to these you know, many claims that show up on the Internet, and pretty quickly, I think, uh, have a formalized way to work through them and discriminate. Sort of walk us through what would happen if a rover or an astronaut or some future spacecraft uh, flies over something and they see something that just looks out of place geologically. What do you think the protocol should be? Well, uh, you know, it's it's pretty sensible. Set E set set sort of the you know the guidelines for the larger scale approach. I mean, you've you've already got principal scientists and researchers who are going to be involved in whatever mission it is or using whatever instrument it is, and so they would circulate that. And uh, you know, you basically you don't want to jump the gun because that's you know I would even argue Chris McKay uh, and his team maybe jump the gun a little bit with the the what could have been the fossil relic in, in the Allen Hills meteorite, uh, what, 84001. Um, you know, you ended up with a presidential press release, or a, a, a news conference, and you get people very excited, and then all of a sudden it seems like a retraction when scientists come back and say, well, it could have been something else, and you yank people around and people stop listening. So the objective here, I think, is you find something, you circulate it, you open it up to a wider set of uh, authorities in the field, and that's why it helps to actually have thought about this ahead of time and developed experts who have thought about this sort of research ahead of time so you actually have those experts in hand. And then once you've done kind of a giggle check amongst a larger crew of uh, scientists and researchers, keep opening it to wider and wider releases, uh, you know, eventually leading to a full-blown uh, disclosure of what may be possibly a discovery, but always making sure that we don't disenfranchise people by, uh, you know, seeming like we're jumping the gun. Um, and I, you know, it's, it's fairly straightforward. Mm -hmm. Now the, the radio SETI people have been working for years on protocols. If they, if they get a signal right? yeah. and, and what they're going to do and whether or not they're going to answer the signal and so forth, there, there's really not that kind of structure and, and scientific consensus on what to do if we find an artifact. Uh, so are you proposing some kind of working group that would work through these issues? Or Certainly. I mean, the paper that I wrote uh, was essentially a call to just get people thinking about it. That's why I, I, uh, I submitted it to the journal uh, Space Policy. Uh, it's sort of a broad level, get the, get the decision makers thinking about, um, you know, what it is we should do in the event of a discovery, but yeah, that's definitely the next point. I mean, I've writing that paper put me in touch with uh, space archaeologists of today, who are the ones who are thinking about treating the Apollo landing sites as heritage sites. So that's that's the flip side of this coin: is you know evaluating our activities in space from an archaeological perspective, and those that's they make some of the primary pool members from which I think such a working group would be formed. Uh, in addition to um, you know, maritime archaeology is a great analogy. Uh, uh, you know, very alien environment as far as our everyday experience goes. And then, of course, you need to have planetary scientists involved because the one thing archaeologists are not prepared as a group to deal with are fundamentally different assumptions about the environment. That's the one thing that doesn't change in archaeology. Earth has always had 1G. It's always had roughly the same atmospheric pressure, the same temperature range. Uh, if you start changing all of that, uh, the the one uh, my favorite hook is that we had to redesign drill bits to operate to actually cut on the Martian surface because the the atmosphere is so uh, so much less dense than Earth that it's actually decompressed. You can think of it right now as you know there's 17 miles of air sitting on top of us helping you push your butter knife into the butter, and if all of a sudden you let all that pressure off, you could have a plenty sharp blade, but all of a sudden it won't seem to cut the way that we're used to it because mm. we're not familiar with that environment. Or maybe something is brittle there that wouldn't be here. 
So you need someone with planetary a planetary mindset to help guide uh, what's an archaeological skill set. Yeah. Now, uh, with xenoarchaeology, we're talking about artifacts instead of being ten thousand years old, or it could be millions or even hundreds of millions of years old. They could be right. very, very deteriorated. Have you given any thought to where we look, how we look? Yeah, actually, there are quite a few, and I hope I'm not giving away a, a paper. I'm in the middle of right, there are a few little things I'm working on, but one of them is there. There are clues here. I mean, Earth is a very, very, very active environment uh, compared to what we know to be quote normal right now, just compared to the rest of the solid bodies in the solar system. Um, and so, you know, we, in a way, you can look at Earth as sort of a fast motion version of the sorts of erosion and, and degradation you'd see on Mars, and much faster certainly than the Moon. Um, and one of those things that I found most intriguing as a potential analog is the uh, the Normandy beachhead. And what what we found there was a, an amazing archaeology paper which showed that as they sift the sand, there are actually rounded grains of metal fragments left over from all of the shrapnel and tanks and things that had been on the beachhead. And they were actually able to do elemental analysis, make some really cool conclusions about were they looking at German stuff, were they not? I mean, I'm, I'm paraphrasing to a, a gross degree. But that sort of idea that you could actually take a handful of Martian sand, and if you knew that this sort of work had been done before, then maybe you can start to build an analog forward if you actually had metal grains that were subangular that showed on a microscopic level evidence of what we now recognize as evidence of machining or simply it's evidence of refining it's uh, isotopes and elements in a way you wouldn't ordinarily find them in nature that's the sort of thing I think uh, you know it, it'd be great if there was just a, a giant pyramid sitting somewhere but <laughs> I don't think we've seen that yet uh, that, that makes it easy too easy on us um, I think really our first Xenoarchaeology discovery, if it's not something like a Bracewell probe or something that comes up and says hello, it might be something subtle like that. It might be a handful of sand that you, you look at the grains and all of a sudden you see it's telling you a story about something that eroded to dust long ago, but we can see the dust. Given the, the vast size of the search space, all the, the solid bodies in the solar system, maybe some of the not-so-solid bodies yeah. uh, like Titan or something like that. Um, sure. Do we have a way to know where to lo start looking, or we just look for the easiest places, like the moon? Yeah, I'd, you know, that's the million-dollar question right there. Uh, you know, that it's all based on what are your assumptions. And, you know, right now, NASA's paradigm, you know, you know uh, Carl Sagan did biochemistry experiments, early astrobiology that suggested you could have silicon-based life on Titan, and, which is chemically viable, there are uh, scientific legs to that avenue of research, but NASA is not pursuing it because we only have one data point. We only know of one kind of life that exists, and that's water-based, carbon-based life. And so from that perspective, that's why we're looking for places where you find the three things. Wherever we find them here, we find life. It's water and energy source and complex molecules. So wherever you find those three criteria satisfied, you know, according from the conservative standpoint, yeah, if we got to put all our eggs in those baskets, yes, we go there. That means Europa. That means near ice caps on Mars or maybe, uh, you know, crater walls where we see evidence of outburst flooding or some place where you can say at least we have those three things working right now. But if you want to look for an active environment that's more Earth-like, you mentioned Titan, that's where you have a hydrologic cycle happening. There are clouds forming and rain is coming down and things are being, you know, moved around and that's where you could have chemistry happening and maybe even the chemistry that ends up somehow becoming self-aware and or at least you know self-propagating and you've got life so you know it, the conservative side you go to what NASA's looking for right now which is the the water-based searches but i think perhaps even more tantalizingly you, you go to places where we know they're geologically active and you have i said hydrologic cycle but in that case it's not water it's it's ethanes and methanes it's it, you can pick any number of assumptions right now we don't you know, it's we're, we're throwing we're throwing darts at the wall right now. Right, but that's why we, that's why we need to think about this. Right. Yeah. By the way, I I, I spoke to David Grinspoon. He's one oh, of the cool. NASA scientists who is keenly interested in Titan as a because we can get we can get to the surface, we can get to where the life might be. Whereas yeah. Whereas in Europa, it's incredibly difficult. Right. But, uh, so, and and as you just pointed out, the 
in the abstract, the ingredients are there. So they're yeah. They're I, you know, I I, I uh, there was a when um, Huygens was landing through the atmosphere. I was still I was still in college. I was doing my undergrad, and I was sitting at the computer with this terrible internet connection uh, in Wyoming and each layer was, was showing up and it was taking forever to load and I was on the phone with, with who would become my wife at the time and she had a faster internet connection in Chicago and she, you know, I kept asking, what does it look like? And she said, oh, I see some squiggly lines and I kept thinking, you know, might there, might there be crystal and I don't know, tree like plant life down there? I said, tell me, tell me what you see. She said, I don't know, there's some colors and things. So, you know, these, these very sort of frontier events, uh, it's just still exciting. We're, people think I, I get the sense anyway that, that the public thinks that ho hum, you know, we've sent probes to most, uh, nearly all, soon to be all of the the major world, the major bodies in the the solar system, and so you know we've we've got it all figured out. We surveyed it, but that's not true at all. I mean, we just we just put our toes in the water, and so the you know this sort of thrill of being on the frontier. I, I think in a roundabout way, that's the answer to your question. Where do we look? I think we're about to find out. I think the more that we survey, the more that the USGS astro, astro uh, geology section keeps putting out uh, maps, which I think is awesome, of other worlds. You can just go get a map of Mars or Titan, and it's geologically complex. It's, fu- it's fully, you know, it's um, you know, the coordinate system is set, and we have access to that info. I think the more we see, the more we'll start to to know what normal is so that we can know what abnormal is. Right. So we've got a long way to go, but it's an exciting field. Yeah. Um, what do you think about, um, well, the astronomical search for extraterrestrial intelligence? I mean, I've spoken to Seth Shostak and others who are, uh, that's, what, that's all they do pretty much. Um, right. You think that's promising at all? Oh, there's definitely merit to it. I mean, of course, you know, we, we right now can either confirm or deny. So it's an open possibility whether or not uh, somebody is transmitting something on, you know, an electromagnetic wavelength that we might be able to detect. Um, and yes, definitely, I think there's merit. But for me, I'm, I'm a physical scientist. I want to get out there. And I, I think that, you know, the, the big advances, this is my bias, of course, you know, the, the big advances are going to be uh, when we actually physically obtain something that we can study, analyze, and then learn something from. I mean, the, the most frustrating thing in the world would be, great, you know, SETI gets a signal, which I would argue would in all likelihood be permanently untranslatable. So we get a couple pings from, say, 600 light years away, and it's verifiable and it's repeatable, and there it sits, you know, until we develop some kind of sort of propulsion system to get over there and actually see what's going on. Uh, I think that may literally just whet our appetites and leave us permanently, uh, you know, yearning for, well, what was that? Uh, whereas on the, on the physical side, I really think the first first contact moment, the one that gets recorded in the history books, is not going to be provided by astrobiology because I think that there's a conceit of time that's built in there that assumes that we're going to have the serendipity to find something while it's alive, while we're alive, when we know how ubiquitous extinctions are and the vast spans of time at play in the in the cosmos so far, so I, so I I do think it's a conceit to think that we will actually find life while it's alive, and by the same token, you know I I'm not sure that you know SETI in its current form is a fairly narrow focus, which is good. That means you can really get into it and eliminate certain things and you know make progress there, but that relies on a whole bunch of assumptions that may not be true, so or you know, at least may not have happened, and. So what are you left with? You're left with what I think is going to happen. You're going to find evidence of some kind of life long extinct, something that it would have left behind because it's, you know, even if you don't preserve the organism, and geology and paleontology show us you can preserve the casts or you can preserve uh, their effects on the environment or on their environment. And that's where I think the action is going to be. I, I, I do think that the search for extraterrestrial artifacts is inexplicably not given as much uh, legitimacy as it should. Because I just want to point out that what are the fundamental assumptions underlying SETI? Well, it's that life has evolved and evolved to a technologically mature state so that there are broadcasts, electromagnetic broadcasts that are happening. Uh, Well, those are a lot of assumptions and and nobody's scoffing at that. I mean, if you're open about them, then you you can operate with it. And in parallel, astrobiology well, that entire field of study, uh, you know, relies on the presumption that 
life has evolved elsewhere, which we've never found. And, uh, you know, where might we find it? How might it operate? Which leads to a bunch of analog research right now. Uh, yet we have no astrobiology discovery, not even, not one. Uh, so for people to turn around and scoff, because I, I met some resistance when I wrote that paper, which surprised me. I thought the paper was really dry. I mean, I'm, I'm personally haven't seen anything that convinces me there is an artifact uh, that we've found or, you know, some sort of evidence. I would love for there to be one. Um, but, you know, there was a lot of resistance. And there was a, uh, someone from the Astrobiology Institute at NASA with, with a grant from there who, you know, accused me of trying to ride the coattails of a more established field to give legitimacy to something that doesn't have it. And which was very curious to me because what are the underlying assumptions beneath the idea of xenoarchaeology? They're exactly the same as astrobiology and SETI. It presumes that life has evolved and evolved to a lesser state than SETI assumes and perhaps a greater state than astrobiology tends to assume as its you know, base level. But what, what, xenoarchaeology, what xenoarchaeology has that the others don't is time. And so I think the weight of time says that xenoarchaeology is going to see its first practical application long before either astrobiology or SETI. Hmm. It's interesting because I, uh, I know astrobiology wasn't that well-respected a field just a few decades ago. Right. Uh, they they seem to gain respect since then. I think yeah, I mean, and public rightfully support. so. <laughs> People are interested in, in that topic more than yeah more and than it, it gives us an opp- <laughs> yeah well it gives us an opportunity to explore aspects of earth you know go for the extreme weird life you know uh, bacteria living in radioactive rock 2 miles down that's boiling water and all sorts of crazy uh, i mean i'm not a biologist so that's all magic to me anyway but uh you know if if uh, those if we can do that with biology to astrobiology i think we can learn a great deal about ourselves by developing a field of xenoarchaeology that lets us look at ourselves through a different lens. Not all extraterrestrial artifacts would be bits of derelict spaceships or evidence of ancient asteroid mining. They might not even be ancient at all. A small group of creative thinkers have come up with an interesting experiment to let a modern ET presence reveal itself, should it choose. This is called Invitation to Extraterrestrial Intelligence, I-E-T-I, and is very much in the spirit of what I was talking about earlier. Boldly venturing into the unknown, willing to fail, not waiting for the powers that be to approve. Go see Ieti. Dot org, I-E-T-I dot org, to see for yourself what it's all about. I was fortunate to speak to Dr. H. Paul Shuk, who runs this experiment. As you know, I'm calling about the uh, website that you're involved with, um, ieeddy.org or invitation right. to EDI. Mm-hmm. Uh, why don't you just give us the the quick uh, introduction as to how that website got set up and what what kind of experiment is trying to perform? The invitation to ETI concept was first proposed by a colleague of mine from the University of Toronto, Professor Paul Correction, Professor Alan Tuff, uh, now sadly deceased at the International Astronautical Congress uh, some years ago. Around the time that the Internet started to really assert itself as a major social force for innovative research projects, the rationale behind the invitation to ETI was very simple. SETI has been practiced as an observational science for half a century now and involves the use primarily of radio telescopes and more recently optical telescopes searching the cosmos for irrefutable evidence of other technological civilizations in the cosmos. This is all very well and good if those other civilizations are generating electromagnetic radiation that we could intercept and perhaps identify. And Alan was always a proponent of SETI research, but he wanted to take the next step. What if there are, and this is highly speculative, what if there are other technologically advanced civilizations so far advanced 
that they might actually be monitoring our planet's communications. Such civilizations might choose not to reveal themselves until and unless we issue a proper invitation. What if there are civilizations that are able to monitor our internet traffic, for example? Paul, uh, Alan rather reasoned that if such civilizations happen to stumble across a web page describing our interest in establishing communication with other civilizations, they might step forward and make themselves known. The great silence, the lack of any signals being detected to date or anything that's been identified as uh, irrefutable proof, has been puzzling and of concern, and a number of hypotheses have evolved, have emerged to explain why we might not be receiving any signals at all. The great silence could be because there's nobody out there. That certainly is a possibility. Or because there's nobody at our technological level able to respond. Or that for some reason we've been quarantined or other civilizations choose to avoid contact out of perhaps fear, perhaps altruism, perhaps any, any sort of reason. But if civilizations exist that are keeping their silence, maybe we can draw them out. Maybe we can uh, rustle the bushes a little bit and, and, and gain some attention and maybe someday eventually achieve dialogue. This was the intention behind the proposal. And at the time that the Invitation ETI was launched, the Internet was so new that uh, there was no reason not to try it as yet another tool in our research. So Alan hired me, brought me on board, to develop a website specifically to issue an invitation that ETI should make contact with humans if they were there and if they had sufficiently advanced technology. Now, the invitation... He didn't think it should come for any one person or any one organization, but rather should be issued on behalf of all humankind. So Alan then pulled together a team of signatories, a group of people from all over the world, from all walks of life, a hundred people with various skills and talents, one particular characteristic in common, that is a desire to achieve interstellar contact. So on his team of signatories, he has, of course, scientists and artists, and philosophers, and poets, and, uh, philo and uh, psychologists, and sociologists, uh, from a um, hundred different people from dozens of countries and dozens of fields. The idea was, when we get a contact, it's going to take a very diverse team to analyze it and decide on what humans, humanity's response should be, if, in fact, we should issue a response at all. This is how the invitation to ETI was born. And it grew to the website that you now see at IETI.org. Sadly, Alan passed away about a year ago, and he's left it to me and his son, Paul Tuff, and his daughter, Susan Tuff, to try to keep the project going. This is a very, very low-cost, potentially high-impact uh, experiment. It is possibly, potentially, the greatest scientific bargain of all time because these days it costs absolutely nothing to put up a website. And the uh, likelihood of success, the probability of a response is very, very low. But if a response does come, if a credible response is received, that can change forever humanity's image of itself and, and our own perception of our place in the cosmos. Yes. Now, um, the one question that comes up in my mind a lot uh, is how would you know if you were contacted by an authentic ET intelligence or by somebody trying to prank you? This is, of course, an excellent question, and we have, in the uh, couple of decades that this project has been underway, we've received quite a few claims that were totally bogus and easily disproven. We cannot ever know 100% for sure that a communication is from ETI, but it's easy to find out when it isn't. Humans have, um, because of our egos, uh, the capacity for deceiving ourselves but not fooling anybody else. And without going into the details of signal verification or communications verification activities, suffice it to say that so far, every single claim we have been able to easily unmask and refute. Unfortunately, that means that we have not found a valid uh, contact yet. We have not achieved the goals of the experiment. On the other hand, 
the other objective of the Invitation to ETI website, in addition to being a message to possible extraterrestrials, is also a powerful message to humanity because any human who visits the site can learn something about ourselves as a species and our quest for contact. Yeah, I, I like that about this website. In fact, I keep thinking, what would I write if I were writing this website? And uh, so you've, you've given us some, uh, some good guidelines and examples there. So far, a negative result. And you have... I wouldn't say a negative result, Paul. I would call this a null result. A null In re- scientific okay. terms, a null result means we have not yet achieved what we set out to achieve. A negative result would be to have achieved the opposite. I understand. Yeah, uh, and that, I, I buy that. Um, a null result. Uh, if you continue to get a null result, how would you interpret that? Is, is, let's, let's say we ran this experiment for a very long time, even the next generation or so. D- does that... Does that mean anything, or is it just... A long-term null result does not really tell us that ETI does not exist, or does not even tell us that ETI does not wish to communicate. What it tells us is that we have not yet uh, stroked the right responsive cord that we're hoping to find. We have not yet hit upon the magic formula that's going to attract their attention. Now... If we look, and and this is true of all SETI experiments, if we do the experiments in their entirety, all of the possible approaches to achieving contact for many generations, and we're talking about a long-term multi-generational effort, but if we do the SETI search in as many different ways as we know how, using as many different techniques as we possess on Earth, and if we do it right and if we do it well and if we do it for generations and still come up dry, there will, be, there will come a point sometime in our distant descendants' lifetimes that humanity will have to reluctantly conclude that maybe we're the only game in town. And that, too, is a powerful result for SETI research, because if we're the only life in the universe, isn't it just possible we'll begin to treat our own planet with a little more reverence and have a little more respect for ourselves and what we have achieved? Yeah, I mean, I think it's incredibly interesting either way, <laughs> However, it comes out. Uh, if we are the only life and the only intelligent life, at least in this neck of the woods, that gives us an amazing amount of responsibility. That- Absolutely. Uh, I like to believe that we already respect our planet and, uh, and ourselves and our neighbors, but we all know that that situation can be greatly improved. Yes. Let's say you do get a message and you can't show that it's bogus, what's the protocol for going beyond that? If we receive a response that invites dialogue, we will, of course, attempt dialogue. The challenge is that the means of communications that we have at our our disposal, all of our technologies are limited by the speed of light, and that means they're distance limited as a function of time. In other words, if a civilization hundreds of light years away someday receives our ones and zeros and reconstructs them into an invitation and chooses to respond, it'll be many generations before that response arrives back at Earth. Let us just only hope that there will be someone here able to uh, receive and interpret that response and maybe reply to it. Well, what about a Bracewell probe? If it was something in our own solar system... The idea of very small, very smart interstellar probes has been around in the SETI community for a long time. You mentioned Ron Bracewell, uh, yes. late uh, Professor Bracewell at Stanford University back in the early 1960s wrote a book called The Galactic Club where he suggested that technology is advancing in the direction that would allow, in very short order, humans to develop interstellar probes, small high-speed probes capable of being our proxies, visiting distant stars, parking themselves in orbit around distant planets, and perhaps being our eyes and our ears across the cosmos. Ron thought if humans are close to developing this capability, more advanced civilizations may already have such technology. Now, if these small, smart interstellar probes do exist, it is conceivable, and Alan Toff thought it was not probable, but at least possible, that Earth might be under scrutiny or being monitored right now. 
perhaps probes hiding in our Oort cloud or in our asteroid belt somewhere where we can't see them, but they can monitor us. Of course, can a probe enter into a dialogue with humanity? That depends upon the level of artificial intelligence on board. Clearly, biological intelligence is unlikely to travel the vast distances between the stars, but um, I would say that artificial intelligence certainly could. If sufficiently high art level of artificial intelligence exists, we may enter into a dialogue with somebody's computer, or more probably our computer may enter into a dialogue with somebody's computer, and that too would be a positive SETI result. Yes, and that would not take years or, or decades, but only minutes perhaps. Very likely, yes. Th there's, um, you've already mentioned that the founder's children are involved. Yes. Um, is it your hope that, that this type of experiment will persist uh, for even to a, a third generation? If SETI of any type is to be successful, it has to persist for many generations. I am of the belief that humanity is in its technological infancy and it's going to take us a long time to mature. And if contact is to be achieved, we're going to have to adopt the long view. So I hope my children's children's children will be involved in SETI research in one form or another. As our technology improves, they will have tools that I could never even have dreamed about. Right, yeah. I mean, we already have... I don't think anybody predicted how important the Internet would be 50 years ago. So, well, maybe somebody did, but <laughs> I'm not aware of it. Um, well, um, anything else you'd like to say about the experiment that my listeners would be interested in? The beautiful thing about invitation to ETI is that it is a self-sustaining, low-cost, or practically zero-cost experiment with very, very long odds, but very, very high prospects. Um, more experiments like this can only benefit humanity in the long run. We are very likely to uncover maybe not even what we're seeking to begin with. Maybe we're not even going to find what we think we're looking for, but research will ultimately find something of value to humanity, which almost always justifies itself. I'll be back with some additional thoughts on the search for alien artifacts in a moment. First, here's a little wild untamed music from Curlew, recorded in 1997.
That was Curlew with Not Innocent, recorded live in 1997. So, what's the plan then? Stating in your proposal that you are unlikely to turn up anything isn't the best way to get telescope time or to get a space mission approved. Sure, elegant little experiments like ieddy.org will arise from time to time, but for now, I think the best strategy is to piggyback on investigations doing respectable science, whether they are Mars rovers or infrared telescopes or lunar orbiters. The analysis is going to have to be careful and skeptical, bending over backwards to find alternative explanations to alien artifacts. Only when we can make a strong scientific case that we have something really anomalous can we justify additional work to search for artifacts. This is just the beginning of the search for extraterrestrial artifacts, or SETA. The naive, confused, wrong beginning, but we are beginning, and I salute the pioneers who are taking these first halting steps. They deserve respect. They deserve the serious conversation about the search for ET that they have ventured to start. Let's join in. And now, the Wow Signal Podcast, seal of podcast approval for podcasting as part of the podcast. Every episode since episode four, I single out one particularly meritorious podcast for recognition. This is a podcast that I have listened to for at least a few episodes. At wowsignalpodcast.com, there is a list of the awardees with links to their homepages. The seventh Wow Signal Podcast Seal of Approval for Podcasting is awarded to the Singularity One on One Podcast by Nikola Danilov. Now, Nikola was my guest on episode three, so that was an implicit endorsement of his podcast, but I've yet to award a seal of approval to him, so let me correct that oversight now. Nikola works hard to make contact with the best people in the futurist, transhumanist, and techno optimism world. He also talks to people who are thoughtful singularity skeptics to give us a broad overview of how some of the best thinkers and writers view our short to medium term future. If you listen to his podcast, you will not run out of material to think about, although some of it may be infuriating since these are people who thrive on controversy and bold statements. So again, congratulations to all the awardees of the WOW Signal Podcasting Seal of Approval for Season 1. The SETI Institute's Big Picture Science with Sash Shostak and Molly Bentley. Ross Blotcher and Carrie Poppy's Oh No, Ross and Carrie. Kelly and Zach Wienersmith's The Weekly Wienersmith. Virginia Campbell's The Brain Science Podcast. Sid Smith's Podcast from the Yellow Room. Penn Gillette's Penn Sunday School. And Nikola Danilov's Singularity One on One. You have just heard the WOW Signal Podcast, podcast seal of approval for podcasting as part of the podcast. Thanks for joining me again on this episode of the WOW Signal Podcast and the last episode of Season 1. I'd love to hear what you think about this episode and this podcast in general. If you want to comment on this episode or any episode of the Wow Signal Podcast, you can leave a comment on the blog at wowsignalpodcast.com or join our Google Plus community. I do not know exactly when season two of this podcast will pick up, although at present the plan calls for the March of 2014. If the right person steps up to help produce and co-host, then it will be sooner. I have several excellent guests on my target list, and if you join the Wow Signal Podcast community on Google+, we can talk about who these people are, who they should be, and what to ask them. 
Season 2 will continue to talk about the major threads we discussed in Season 1, except for UFOs. The UFO topic will not be directly addressed on this podcast in Season 2, although I do think we need to raise the laughter curtain on that topic as well, so I'll be helping a team to get that moving on a separate podcast. I'd like to thank all of my guests for the first season of the WOW Signal podcast. In order of appearance, Antonio Paris, Jeffrey Landis, Nikola Danilov, David Grinspoon, Seth Shostak, Bing Garthright, Duncan Forgan, Isaac Stott, Ben Wright McGee, and Paul Shook. I also want to thank our musical artists for season one, Mike Griffin of Hypnos.com, Sleep Research Facility, Kniform Records artists Jason Robinson and Alucha Tistas, the house band of the universe, Paul D. Miller, a.k.a. DJ Spooky, George Hobb, John Baez, and Curlew. Also thanks to our voiceover artists, Joyce Abma and Aaron Carr, and to North Carolina-based graphic artist Ben Armstrong, who designed our logo. Links to learn more about all these folks will be in the show notes at wowsignalpodcast.com. And now, here's a little more music from DJ Spooky to take us out. This has been Episode 10 of the WOW Signal Podcast. The spoken content of the WOW Signal Podcast is distributed under the Creative Commons Attribution Sharealike 3.0 license. All music is presented with the permission of the artists. To comment on this episode, to ask questions, or to learn more about the guests, the topics covered, or the music, please visit the show notes at wowsignalpodcast.com. Mm-hmm.